Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this year's 2017 AdLib Conference. Um, we are this year's student co-chairs, and we are just going to take a second to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Camille Lejeune. I'm a senior art history major from Lafayette, Louisiana. My name is Isabel White. I'm a senior uh, Stratcom major from Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm Liz Terry. I'm also a senior uh, journalism mass comm major from Charlotte. We are so excited <laughs> to have you all here today and um, really happy and thankful that our awesome alumni came back to share some of their stories with us about how their liberal arts education at Washington and Lee has been integral um, in their career paths in the advertising and marketing agencies. Um, before we start, we'd like to thank uh, the alumni for coming back from all over um, to share their insights with us today. Um, we'd also like to thank Sheila Colon, Taylor Bryant, and Carrie Ritter for all of their hard work um, in helping us put on this conference. And we'd like to thank Professor Bauer, who um, in 2011 brought back alumni and made the conference what it is today. <clears throat> all three of us are really passionate um, about the power of a liberal arts education in the marketing and advertising industry. Um, we all believe that WNL has taught us to rely on our depth of knowledge of people and culture um, and communications for our industries. Um, and so with that said, it's um, at, but helping plan an entire conference um, for, is a daunting task for three college students. And sometimes it feels like absolutely everything that could go wrong is going wrong, um, which I know is a feeling that we all share sometimes. So today I'm especially excited uh, to welcome our first speaker to the stage to share his war story on how to handle unexpected adversity and how to still come out on top. Um, Jared McKee is a 2008 graduate of WNL and a group director at Cross Media, an independent full service media agency in Philadelphia. At Cross Media, Jared oversees a portfolio of accounts, including Advanced Auto Parts, Dogfish Head Brewery, and several startups. Before Cross Media, he held several positions at Starcom Worldwide in Chicago and New York, working on such accounts as ESPN, Visa, and Kraft. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to our first AdLib conference speaker, Jared McKee. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Um, thanks for coming out. And uh, thanks for being here. I know it's early. Uh, raise your hand if you're tired. <laughs> so cool. We're all on the same page. Um, I'll try to keep this a little bit energetic, a little bit exciting. I don't have slides, so we're going to do this live. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, that was great. Couldn't have said it better. Took out about the first two minutes of my talk, so that's good. <laughs> um, I am the class of 2008. My name is Jared, and uh, I am the group director across media. Um, as you mentioned, we're, we're an independent shop, um, kind of an underdog, kind of an up-and-comer in this space. Uh, this week, we were recognized by Adweek as uh, Agency 3.0, uh, kind of the, the top 12 new agency models out there. Um, <clears throat> and I think what you'll hear throughout this is the importance of honesty and trust. Um, and you mentioned, you know, how, how, does, how do these war stories, how does everything tie back to a liberal arts education? And the fact of the matter is um, that was instilled at me here at Washington and Lee, right? You guys have the honor code. It, it governs all we live by. Um, and it really instills in us, you know, a, a true sense of virtue um, and, and honesty and truth. And I think that really gets to the core uh, as to what makes agencies great and what great advertising is all about. That truth, that honesty, and that trust. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, the, the topic of the conversation is certainly how to win when it all goes wrong. And, and trust me, it'll go wrong sometimes. Um, but how you react in that moment and being able to tie back to those values and that truth is what's going to set you apart and what's ultimately going to help you win. Um, I know we're talking about war stories here, but just to give you a quick background on, on the last 48 hours, because that's probably a good one. Um, I've slept about four hours a night for the last six days. Hi, welcome to new business. Lock the doors. Don't let anybody leave. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but really, we're, as I mentioned, we're, we're an upstart, right? We're, we're growing super quickly, um, and we've got uh, clients that we're onboarding now while we're still out the door pitching new ones. Um, and what that's led to is, is kind of a lot of stress, a lot of late nights, 
Um, and ultimately things like last night where we had people flying from the ANAs in Miami, me flying down from Baltimore, us all meeting in Tampa at noon for a pitch that started at 12.30, flying back from Tampa to Baltimore last night, landing at 11 o'clock, driving down to Harrisonburg last night, waking up as early as I can this morning and speeding down I-81 so I could be here today. So it's a glorious life. Um, you're gonna love it, trust me. It's, it's as glamorous as everybody made it out to be. But, um, <clears throat> but no, more importantly, um, I kinda wanna get to a few practical examples of, uh, of how you win when, when things go wrong and, and how you pivot uh, on these unexpected circumstances that you really can't foresee. Um, hopefully these will be uh, you know, a little bit entertaining, but, uh, but the point is that we, we kind of learn a thing or two and you guys walk away with something that can help your career. And uh, hopefully you remember it someday and hopefully when you're dealing with tough times, you, know, you, you, you kind of look back on this and realize how you can rise to the occasion. Um, so I'll tell the first story uh, is the advanced auto parts pitch. So uh, it's, it's one of my larger clients. Um, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're the second biggest client across the agency. We have, uh, we have offices, as you mentioned, in Philly, but we're headquartered in New York and LA. Um, and as, as part of that growth, Philly's kind of been this satellite office, right? We've, we've kind of been the, the lowest hanging fruit uh, or, or not the lowest hanging fruit, the, the third link on the chain, um, sort of the, the rascal uh, or the, or the you know, redheaded stepchild. Sorry if anybody has her there. <laughs> um, and, but with that, we, we, we've been able to step in when you know, the mothership has kind of been unable to hand things. And, and that was definitely the case with AAP. So we, uh, we were fortunate enough to win the US bank business um, at the end of the third quarter last year. Um, unfortunately, right after we landed the business and began onboarding that with you know, all of our best people, our new business A team, uh, an amazing opportunity comes down from Advanced Auto Parts, um, a game changer for us, but something that New York couldn't take on. Um, so they flipped it down to us in Philly and we kind of said, sure, this is about 15 to 20 times bigger than all of our accounts. Um, it's much bigger than all of our accounts put together, actually. Um, how many times do you want us to win this? <laughs> and uh, let's take it head on. So we had no resources. We didn't really have our, our full new business folks. Um, we didn't have a, the ability to go through the standard process, you know, uh, follow the nice three month long pitch, have all the insights ready to go, have the strategy, and then let everybody do their thing. We, we put this all together in a few weeks time uh, with, with very, very minimal resources and, and you know, ultimately helped to win it. But, the, the more important thing is, is kind of the story and, and how we got there. Um, <clears throat> so the RFI comes down and uh, we see it, it's about 275 questions uh, and there's about 10 tabs with hundreds and hundreds of sales with requests request for pricing, right? Um, that's kind of the way the, the industry's been built for a little bit. Uh, it's been all about efficiencies, all about how can you get more media for less, right? We're a media agency, so it's not like we're, we're creating the ads, we're, we're creating the ideas. We're, we're planning and buying when it really comes down to it. Now, we do a lot more than that, but that's the way some clients look at us, is can you get me this thing for cheaper, right? Um, and at its core, that is not what we're about across media. Um, we are not about you know, unique buying models and leveraging our clients' dollars and, and kind of hedging against the industry and all these things. Um, we're about effectiveness and, and truth and, and, and not so much focus on you know, dollars and cents, which sounds kind of crazy for a media agency, but trust me, it works. <laughs> um, so we get it and we're like, oh God, this is probably a bad sign, this probably isn't good for us, but hey, 275 questions and you know, an extremely strenuous cost exercise, probably something really good for us to go through, a great exercise, right? Um, something that we can use next year when we get you know, a nice pitch that we'll probably actually have a chance at winning. Um, <clears throat> then we get a call. Hey, you guys are moving on. Uh-oh. <laughs> so um, great. Positive news, whatever, right? But we're, we're kind of shocked, we're kind of surprised. And again, we're like, how are we gonna do this? Um, <clears throat> we, get, we get set for the pitch. We find out that the only day they can do the pitch is um, a day when uh, our CEO and analytics lead are scheduled to meet with other clients. 
Um, our head of digital is scheduled to meet with uh, US Bank, who was an account we had just won and transitioned on. So again, uh, couldn't have gone worse. Unforeseen circumstances, can't really control. Uh, we're going in with, uh, without our A-team. Um, <clears throat> so lo and behold, we, uh, we get to Raleigh, and um, our, our, our pitch and, and kind of our message is, is really tight around data and analytics and, and kind of the science of, of advertising and media. Um, <clears throat> that's led by a gentleman named Lee Beal, who is uh, extremely talented and extremely gifted and an amazing person in the room uh, for a pitch. Well, Lee's sick, <laughs> and the data's not there, right? So it's, uh, it's about 8 o'clock the night before. Uh, we're pitching 10 o'clock the next morning, and we haven't seen any of the data. Um, and we don't know if Lee's actually going to be able to speak because he sounds horrible. Um, <clears throat> so he gets in at 8 o'clock. And, uh, and we start to look at the data, and we start to pull it apart, and we start to build out a deck, which, by the way, this is not the way you should do things. But um, we basically see that we're about to tell the client that they're ugly and they have no friends, right? Um, your target's wrong. Your creative's wrong. And your media's wrong, right? We got their mixed model where like, we completely disagree with this. Their creative was all about, you know, it was kind of the Marlboro Man of, of auto parts, right? It's, it's black and white. It's rock music in the background. It's, you know, a guy with a white T-shirt and grease on his hands. And that's, that's not real, right? That's not what we, what we wanted to be about. And we actually said, you got a huge female opportunity. And oh, by the way, this, this advertising is sexist. Um, not to mention that, um, you know, we had, had very sound data proof that, that, quite frankly, they were going after the wrong audience. Um, and I got nervous as hell. I was like, how are we going to walk in? You know, we're the underdog here. We're walking into this place where, where we're kind of the newcomer. Um, and we're going to tell them that they don't know what they're doing. This is like a $14 billion retail brand. Um, sophisticated organization, thousands of stores across the country. And we're going to tell their CMO and um, their executive vice president that, that They've been doing it all wrong, right? And that they have to go tell their new CEO, who's just hired from Pepsi, that, hey, we've made a lot of mistakes and we need to completely change the way we've been doing things. Gulp. Uh, <laughs> so we walk into the pitch and, and we say, you know, we can either, we can either tell them what we think or, uh, or we can tell them what we think they want to hear. And uh, our CEO said, absolutely not. We got to tell them what we think. We got to go with our gut. Um, that's what we believe to be true and, and we have to stick with it. So we walk in and we start talking and we get to our bid on transparency and I can talk more about that later in the, in the digital panel. Um, and the, we finish our, our you know, piece on transparency and the executive vice president gets up and starts to leave. And we're like, oh, great, awesome reaction. Um, just what we wanted to hear. And we kind of said that, you know, one of, one of the uh, people in the marketing organization said, you know, Charles, uh, don't you have a ton of collect? Don't you have a lot of questions? Like, isn't this important? Because um, I guess he had been grilling a lot of the other agencies along the way as it relates to transparency. And he just said, "No, these guys definitely know what they're talking about. I'm out of here." Awesome. Okay, kind of unexpected. Um, then we get to the target, and we start telling them, "Hey, we we kind of think you're approaching this the wrong way, right?" We do a little bit of constructive feedback, as we just spoke about, right? Um, so so we start kind of pivoting the conversation and politely suggesting that maybe they need to think about things a little bit differently. The CMO stops us and he says, why don't you guys just tell us what you really think? And we said, okay, this is wrong. This is completely and inherently wrong. And oh, by the way, if you flip through the next slides, there's about 10 slides worth of data that all support our point. Well, we flip through those 10 slides. He rips them out of the presentation and he looks at us and he says, I have a meeting at three o'clock this afternoon. This is a lot better than what I'm going to present. I'm just going to take this into the meeting so we're like okay good vibes this is going well like nice like good first date all right um, so then we get to creative you know and we're like hey we're, we're a media agency um, and we're gonna come in here and kind of step on toes a little bit um, and probably ruffle a few feathers so then we give our spiel on you know creative and how you need to relate to the audience and have true insights and actually connect with people and not marginalize them by saying like, you're not as cool as this awesome hulky guy in the garage. Um, <clears throat> and we go through that and he's like, thank you. Thank you so much. I've been trying to tell people this all along. Everybody's been coming in here and telling us how great we are. And you guys have basically told us all the things that we've 
done wrong, right? Um, and oh, by the way, that's reflected in the sales of my business. So I've been looking for a partner to come in here and tell us we need to change. Um, and that's what we've been uh, you know, looking for in the marketplace. Um, and it's been a little bit uh, of a tough journey. We've talked to tons and tons of agencies and everybody has basically told us we're the best thing since sliced bread. So Lo and behold, we uh, we come to we come on to win the business. I think we kind of wanted in the room. You know, we walked out like, hey, that's that's never happened. And oh, by the way, the consultants that were sitting on the side running a lot of the negotiation, they don't like that because they just lost all their leverage because we just found out like we were the cool kids. Uh, <laughs> so they're a little bit upset with us and they start negotiating with us on rates. But um, but the client comes back and and they don't care at that point, right? They they want it. Um, they want us and uh, and they awarded us the business and. You know, I think what you can what you can learn from that is, um, you know, it's it's important to be honest. It's important to lead with your gut. You guys are all smart people, right? You you, you know what you're talking about um, because you approach it in a way that's thoughtful and that's researched and isn't just off the cuff. Um, so you know, as you kind of come into these circumstances in your career and you think things are tough and you think you've got to deliver a tough message, trust yourself, right? Um, be honest. Be open. Have an opinion always have an opinion. It's what clients will pay you for, right? Nobody's paying us to tell them they're the greatest and they need to keep doing what they're doing. They're all looking for change um, and you need to be willing to deliver that, trough, that, that tough message, um, especially if you think it's, it's gonna be something that somebody doesn't wanna hear. Um, and you need to trust yourself and, and be true to your yourself and always be motivated by you know, what we talk about here at, at Washington and Lee, honesty and truth. Um, <clears throat> And you know that 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 issue of, of truth and and trust really is what makes great relationships between great clients and great agencies. Um, and another really awesome practical example of that is uh, is what we just went through with GNC and the Super Bowl. So <clears throat> I don't know if any of you guys have followed that at all, but uh, the week of the Super Bowl, GNC found out that their first ever Super Bowl buy uh, that they had executed with Fox was pulled by the NFL. Um, and if anybody's worked at all with, with any of the leagues, you know how difficult of a process that can be. Uh, the NFL, the Olympics, they're brutal. You go through incredible amounts of um, pre-approvals so that you can meet all the guidelines. There's, there's a ton of kind of red tape that you have to go through there. You have to get approval from the networks. You have to get approval from the league. You have to get approval from the IOC, from the USOC, from the Blah, 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 OC. It's, it's, it's nonstop. Um, and we followed all the right processes. We did it all the right way. And it was the first Super Bowl spot for us as an agency. And it was the first Super Bowl spot for, G for GNC. Um, so everything had been, been approved. We, we sent the storyboards. We sent the scripts. We got the creative approved. Everything was good to go. Fox was locked and loaded. Uh, the NFL, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, um, made a ruling that seemingly came out of nowhere and, uh, and didn't make a whole lot of sense to the general public. Uh, and decided that the week of the game, actually Tuesday, um, they were gonna pull the spot. They said, GNC sells products that contain substances that are banned by the NFL. Therefore, GNC advertising is not allowed within NFL programming. Um, that's kind of a problem when Super Bowl spots are going for like $5 million. And when the CMO announces to the entire organization that they're doing this uh, to a standing ovation and a round of applause. Um, and oh, by the way, when they've got uh, executives and, and leadership from all over the country flying to, flying to Pittsburgh for a giant Super Bowl party that they're hosting about this whole campaign kickoff um, around change. Um, so that happened. That was real. Uh, we had to call the clients and tell them like, hey guys, um, sorry to break it to you, um, but, but this is real. This is what happened. We got to make the most of this situation. So our team went to work uh, right away. We, we pivoted. We said we got to cancel everything immediately. So we did that. Um, and then we needed to come up with a new strategy and a new campaign within 24 hours. And we did that. Um, we got spots placed in the, uh, in the Grammys, in the Oscars. Um, we, we pivoted from a, from a linear television campaign to uh, a digital focus message around the Super Bowl. Um, everybody rallied around across the agency, across all three offices, and, and really pitched in. I mean, I don't work on the business at all, um, but I was involved in the day-to-day. -day. We had folks from LA involved in the day-to-day -day trying to help out. Everybody kind of rallied around and got this thing done. We sent... Um, 
a bunch of t-shirts, you know, from, from cross media, it, it seems trivial, right? But we wanted to show the clients that like, we kind of had their back, we were in this together. So we sent them a bunch of t-shirts, a bunch of stuff for their party to kind of make everybody feel better um, and, and kind of still have something fun to talk about since they, they weren't going to have a spot. Um, and really what, it, what, what we got back from the client was this, you know, amazing thanks and amazing sense of trust and partnership um, and also some really great results. So I think within the first uh, week and a half of, of the new campaign launching, we had like 15 million online video views, right? Not nearly what a Super Bowl spot's going to get you, um, but probably about half and uh, probably for about a fraction of the cost. So good strategy. Glad we stuck with our gut the whole time. Uh, and um, then, you know, like I mentioned, we, we were able to pivot um, and come in last minute and get some spots placed in some amazing programming like the Academy Awards and, and the Grammys. Um, and I think, you know, the message there and, and really what we can take away is there's no contract for trust, right? Um, it's not something that we can put in place. It's not something that you can pitch against. It's something that you just need to act, right? It, it, it's all about how you carry yourselves um, and how you act in, in times of need or in times of great stress um, or in times of great difficulty. And um, like I said at the beginning, that's what great agencies and great clients and their relationships are built upon. It's all trust, and that's not something that can be put in the language of your service agreement with your client. It's something um, that you can only do through your actions. And you know, I think um, we, talk about, we talk about that a lot here. I think that's instilled in all you guys every single day that you know, we can say a lot of things and what we say matters, um, but how we act is more important. And, and by acting honorably um, and by acting with your client's interests always first, um, you'll help build that trust and, and, and it'll be really powerful and it'll cement you and your agency or you know, whatever your business is um, as a trusted advisor and, and not just a vendor. Um, and I think that's what will ultimately set you up for success um, and what has you know, really, really helped solidify the relationship for us in GNC, which you know, is an amazing brand for us to have in the portfolio and, and something that's really become kind of our core that's helped us build upon. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's my speech. I think we're doing pretty good on time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, again, like I said, the key message, you know, be honest, be yourself, hustle every single day, um, and really focus on, on ways that you can build that trust and, and be a true trusted agent and trusted advisor for your clients. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Questions? Fire away. What was your major when you were in school? Yeah, I was a uh, business admin major. Um, so. I, I didn't really know um, what I wanted to do when I got here. I knew I wanted to get into business, but, uh, but kind of caught the marketing bug probably about my, my junior year between taking a few classes, endorsement there, uh, and, uh, and getting involved in, um, in ad class, um, and then some internships that, I, that I'd done throughout the summer. So uh, that, that kind of steered me towards the marketing world. Uh, I actually didn't want to go agency side. When I first came out of school, I wanted to go client side. Um, ended up selling copiers in Northwest Illinois for a while, which is a story for another time and a, and a few more drinks. Um, but, uh, but I had a, a professor that steered me back towards the agency life and um, Thank you, uh, and uh, and you know worked out ever since. So so about a year after uh, I graduated, I, I started up with an agency, Starcom, uh, out in Chicago, and uh, and that's how I'm here today. Anybody else? For the uh, GNC work, did you guys have to completely redo the spots and the creative and everything? For Good, question. Good question. Good um, question. No, but. That is a big part of what you have to do when you're working with like a league or the Olympics or um, any of those governing bodies, right? So the networks have their standards and guidelines, um, but the leagues and you know, the, the Olympics have completely different ones. So um, a great example of, of having to do that is actually Coca-Cola owns the rights to all non-alcohol and coffee beverages within the Olympics, right? So anything, water, Orange juice, soft drinks, Gatorade, can't have it, can't be in there. Um, but we, Visa, uh, were shooting spots you know, with uh, Olympic athletes, right? And they don't want to be seen coming out of the pool or coming out of their training drinking a Coca-Cola. 
not really doesn't really vibe with the whole like you know world class athlete fitness thing, right? Um, so there there is a lot of pivoting that needs to be done. Um, and we had an instance where you know we were on set. Missy Franklin was doing some swimming, um, and the team was going to have her come out, and she was going to drink drink an orange juice. Um, and we had to like on the spot pivot and say, I think that's going to be a real problem. Um, you can't actually the, the rules are insane, but you can't engage with a beverage. Engaging with a beverage means like putting it near your mouth. You're allowed to hold it as long as it doesn't look like a clearly defined package from another brand. So it can't look like a Gatorade bottle. It can't be a white orange juice thing because that looks like Tropicana. Like it's, it's nuts, right? It needs to be a clear container with a straw in it, orange juice, period. That's it. And oh, by the way, they have to hold it. They can't even raise it towards their mouth. Um, so there are a lot of times where like we need to go back and we need to hack that together in some way, shape, or form um, after a spot has been produced. And it's a bit nuanced. Um, creative teams typically tend to approach it by shooting a few alternatives, so you kind of always have a fallback option. But when you're working with partners like that, you need to really plan for that stuff going in because you're probably going to miss something. It's it's just part of part of the you know what you have to deal with when uh, when you're approaching those kind of projects. But GNC, no, because we didn't air it in the Super Bowl. So Spot's out there. It's really cool. It's a really cool campaign. Um, and they produced a ton of great content behind it. Um, so check it out. It's all about you know, having the courage to change. And there's these awesome stories of people that have dealt with adversity and have used GNC and their products to kind of change their lives. It's, it's, it's awesome. Plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> cool. What's up? So you've, worked at a, you've worked at a holding company. And you've also worked at an independent shop. Do you have any advice for, for anyone as they you know, navigate that world? And, and the <coughs> yeah, great question. Um, independent shop, right? Yeah. Yep, awesome. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. Um, look, they're both great. I love where I'm at now, and I loved what I did before. Uh, it's kind of odd. Like a lot of people, when you change agencies, there's like a little bit of ba a bad blood, right? Maybe you didn't have a great experience at the last one. Um, I do think there's a difference, right? Um, holding companies are, are public companies, right? They're driven by uh, profit. They have shareholders, all of that kind of stuff, right? But they also have incredible, incredible resources. Um, you know, they're, they, they get the first look at a lot of different things. And, you know, really they have a stable of absolutely thoroughbred clients. Um, and it might be a little bit secure. It might be a little bit safe, right? Um, but you're going to learn a lot and the, the learning curve and the things you're able to be exposed to at, at a holding company uh, agency or you know, a big agency, whatever you want to call it, um, are incredibly powerful and I think provide a, a really steep learning curve, especially early on in your career. Now, an independent shop or a smaller agency, you're going to have your hands in a lot of different things, right? You're going to be able to touch a lot of different projects. You're going to be able to, you know, maybe plan um, or be involved in, in more sorts of things than you would if you had a team of 25 people, right? You're going to have to do it all yourself. Um, and I think there's an awesome learning curve associated with that too. Um, the one difference I would say independent versus holding company is, um, you know, there's, there's no... There's no blinders there, right? We're, we, we call it a dual business model, right? We say you can't be a doctor and a pharmacist. You can't prescribe the drugs and make money off the drugs, right? Um, so I think being independent, not being beholden to any other media providers, media entities, um, allows us to act in absolute transparency and absolute trust. Um, and I think that's a way you know, that, that I've seen as, as a real positive benefit um, because you know, I value my clients and, and, and I'm motivated by their success and, and not the success of our bottom line. We have time for one more question. If and I said you guys value transparency a lot, but have you ever had instances where your client acted, reacted like really badly to your transparency and you had to deal with that? Yeah. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> um, yeah, because you have to deliver unfortunate news a lot of time, right? Um, it goes back to sticking with your values, right? I mean, that is what we're built upon. So if we don't act that way, then it's all a house of cards, right? I mean, that's our pitch, right? Transparency. Right now, that's the biggest problem or the biggest concern in our industry, specifically in media. Um, 
So yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to deliver bad news all the time. It's, it's part of, like I'm on the account side, right? I don't work in analytics or anything like that. So, so that's really my job most of the time. Um, and it's tough. Um, and, and you kind of have to take it on the chin a lot and you kind of have to deal with the venting and say, I understand. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, it's business, right? And, and the people on the other end of the phone, they might get emotional, um, but they get that and they understand that. And as long as, you know, you've, you've acted as if leading up to that, then, you know, they know it's, it's ultimately the right thing. It might take a while and you might need to rally your team after you deliver that bad news. Um, and you might need to really be on your A game for the next, you know, few weeks and stuff like that and maybe over deliver a little bit or over communicate following that. But um, I would absolutely say that, you know, it, it honesty is always the best policy and it's, it's good to be really forthright. Um, you want to have a solution when you deliver bad news, right? You don't just want to call and say like, we're screwed. <laughs> deal with it like um so so there's a right way to do it right and and if your solutions oriented um i think everybody you know ultimately understands where you're coming from and, and values that cool awesome thanks guys